Humans are the only species in the universe with concepts of hatred and vengeance, and this is what makes us so warlike. The Galactic Council's decision to punish us for exceeding their arbitrary population cap backfires horribly because of this. When 26-kilometer-long extraterrestrial ships appeared in orbit, they were met with equal parts joy and terror. Joy in that we weren't alone, and that we might soon fly with them. Terror from our own stories, the thoughts that they would break us make us into slaves. Countries raced to make first contact. Welcoming messages were broadcast, as the world watched with bated breath. For three days those broadcasts were met with silence. They did nothing but sit there. That was what the public thought. But behind closed doors there were reports of them coping vast amounts of data, breaking through firewalls and the like with little effort. On the fourth day a message came from them, a simple audio file available in every known language. It was a clearly synthetic voice speaking without emotion. Humanity, you are guilty of breaching the galactic population limit for a planet. You are allowed no more than five billion individuals. We will return you to compliance. That is when fear took over from joy. Those twenty ships began raining fire down upon our most populous cities. We tried to fight back, even as diplomats tried to get through to them. We had no idea there was a galactic consensus. But despite our best efforts, the slaughter continued. When they finished, they sent another message. It was that same voice, one we had come to despise. Those who hear this, congratulations on surviving. We wish you the best, and look forward to seeing you join our number. With that, those ships left, leaving us alone again. We had to mourn those we lost, taken by an uncaring hand. In the aftermath, world leaders came together. For the first time dot in our history, the entire world had a common enemy. Most cast aside previous issues to join up. Those who didn't were swiftly removed by their people, replaced by others who were willing to work. In the ashes of a split people, humanity became one. We threw ourselves into reaching space. We were determined to find those murderers and have vengeance for those lost. By working together in a few short years, we had created our first space-saving warship. Data we had scraped from the invaders was analyzed and taken to create our own drives. We cheered when the first FTL engine was proven to work, but we did not stop there. We created smaller unmanned vessels. They traveled to the asteroid belt mining for resources. We made a shipyard in geostationary orbit over the Pacific Ocean. We threw ourselves into advancing as fast as possible, leeching our combined rage to propel us. We expanded, reaching out to nearby habitable planets. We created colonies, increasing our number. We made more and more ships, each carrying the most advanced technology we could cram inside. And we hunted. We hunted for the other races. We found them by chance, a lost ship coming into our space. Immediately we seized it, taking it apart for all the knowledge we could. Its inhabitants, a species resembling half a meter tall wood lice, were understandably terrified of us. But cooler heads prevailed on boarding. They were civilians, not our targets. But we could use them, and we did. We convinced them we wished to join the wider galaxy. They were more than willing to help, as apparently bringing in a new species would make them famous. But behind our smiling faces, daggers were sharpened. They would lead us to their center. We would find out which race was responsible. When we found out who, they would realize just how big a mistake they had made. It was our transmissions that allowed us to be found. A patrol ship came across them when listening to the background noise of the galaxy. Recognizing the source as that of undiscovered sapient life, they notified the ruling race, the Zyvarg. Such a discovery would be met with joy another race to join the nine others. They first sent an unmanned probe to scan our planet. They had their own systems in place, a set of galactic laws and regulations. By understanding our planet, they could evaluate its life. They could understand which regulations would be required for resource management. With advanced stealth technology, it hung unnoticed in orbit. It measured the physical aspects, land mass and water content. It counted the population, centers, making estimates at to our numbers. They cared not for the social aspects. They reasoned that it would be different to how we acted on the galactic stage. If they had, maybe things would have turned out differently. The only part of our culture it sampled was that of the noise we made. To confirm we weren't an anomaly, 
but a true sapient race. It found us more than fitting the bill. With that satisfied, the probe left to report back to the Cyvarg. They read our data. They sent a standard first contact fleet. Twenty ships to combat any unforeseen circumstances. Twenty ships to ensure our compliance. Twenty-six kilometer long ships descended into the atmosphere. They were made of black metal, oblong shaped. Their surface was smooth save for the bottom. The bottom held a series of long mountings resembling enormous cannons. On near silent engines they spread over the globe. Each ship flew to a predetermined point, hovering over highly populated cities. As they reached their destination they hung silently in place, like a hammer poised to strike. Their presence was met with a mixture of emotions. Joy rang strong as this was proof we were not alone in the universe. But it was accompanied by fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of our own creation, as tales like Independence Day and War of the Worlds hung in the forefront of our minds. Politicians raced to make contact. They created messages, those of peace and friendship. Each wanted to make their own the first contacted. Each wanted to go down in history as the one to first greet our extraterrestrial neighbors. Others stoked the flames of xenophobia. They saw them as competition, as those to be beaten. But throughout it all, the ships hung silent. Messages were received but not responded to. But they were not idle. Intelligence reports were created and passed on to those who would listen. They all found the same thing. These surprise guests, these aliens, were accessing vast amounts of data. Any security protocols were blazed through. Any secrets accessed without effort. But as for what they wanted, that was a mystery. For three days, the alien ships hung in orbit. For those three days, intelligence agencies battled with their digital connections. But the war was over before they had realized it had begun. They were hopelessly outmatched. In the hours it took for them to lock down one access, dozens more took their place. It was broken down and analyzed by their computers. Algorithms pulled word structure apart, creating a comprehensive translation between the human languages and their own. Census data was taken to produce an accurate population count. Once the third day was completed, they finally spoke to the world. A simple video was released. It was dumped onto the Internet before being automatically loaded onto any available device. It showed a black screen at first, with white text appearing. As it appeared, a synthetic voice spoke them aloud. Humanity. You are guilty of breaching the galactic population limit for a planet. You are allowed no more than five billion individuals on this scale of planet. We will return you to compliance. The joy that arose from this sudden contact was smothered. Their words were cruel, though the voice lacked emotion. Its indifference caused fear to ramp up. To the aliens, this was a paper exercise. But for us, it would be a slaughter. As soon as the message ended, the twenty ships began their attack. The cannons below swiveled, glowing brightly. A series of metal rods were launched at enormous speeds, far beyond the speed of sound. They slammed into the sites they flew over, crushing buildings to dust. The impact shook the area around, a localized earthquake of horrific proportions. Again and again they fired, leaving their targets in ruins. In less time than it took to boil a kettle, hundreds of millions had been killed. The military acted immediately. Aircraft were launched in the hopes of stopping them. Ships launched cruise missiles to pummel them, but despite all we fired, none found their mark. Their sleek metal surface slid back as a multitude of laser turrets extended. With pinpoint precision, they intercepted our attacks. We were outmatched, outgunned, and defenseless. A few politicians hoped to stop it with diplomacy. They sent messages pleading for mercy, for peace. They said we could sort out ourselves, but those words fell on deaf ears. They moved ponderously, an unrelenting force. Cities in their path tried to empty, people running for their lives. Screams arose as cruel weapons aimed at them, but they were soon cut off as death reaped those in their way. After a day of devastation, they stopped as suddenly as they began. A new message was sent out, again played automatically. It was that same black screen, with the same white test. That same voice spoke again, as indifferent as it had spoken before. Those who hear this, congratulations on surviving. We wish you the best and look forward to seeing you join our number. It was met with a stunned silence. They had murdered nearly three billion of us. Now they wished us well.
they wanted us to join them in the stars. With the same speed they arrived, nineteen ships left, leaving us to mourn and rebuild. The final ship, having carved a trail of blood across the United States, maneuvered into orbit. It jettisoned a single cargo crate before leaving itself. The world was silent as we collectively reeled from what we had seen. Smoking and dust-filled ruins of our centers of life littered the globe. Their populations wiped out at the whim of an uncaring hand. Almost painfully slowly, relief efforts were sent. We knew the chances of finding survivors was practically non-existent, but we had to try. As soon as the first people arrived, images were broadcast of the wreckage. It was clear just how efficient the invaders' weapons had been. With the odd exception, nothing stood anymore. Even as efforts were underway, an emergency meeting was called between world leaders. They came together without hesitation. Rivalries and disagreements were set aside, as all had been affected. The main chair, Helen Bork, the Prime Minister of England, addressed them together, her voice carrying the weight of all lives lost. Ladies and gentlemen, kings, queens, presidents, and prime ministers, in the past week we have both gained and lost. We have gained the knowledge that intelligent life is not confined to our planet. We have gained knowledge that not only is space travel truly possible, but viable in traversing the cosmos. But the price we paid for this knowledge was far too high. From the reports available, it is estimated that nearly three billion people have been murdered. We will never have an accurate death count. Centuries of culture has been ended. The economic impact will be felt for generations to come. The question we must ask ourselves is how do we move on from this? The world we knew is no more. Is it right to go back to how we were, or should we unite? And what about those murderers who slaughtered our fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, our sons and daughters? Can we let them go unpunished? Her speech created a buzz, bought only in the room but around the world. We watched as they decided our next moves even as individuals tried to continue life. However, in the midst of the pain and sorrow, joy sparked. First in Mumbai, then in New York, survivors were found. They were battered and bruised. Some had lost limbs, others the use of parts of their bodies. But each one was celebrated. After debates raged for days, a consensus was made. Going back to a divided world was a mistake. We had a common enemy. From the ashes of what had once been a unified people would be born. There were some leaders who refused to join together. They left, seeing themselves as true leaders for their own people. They expected to be met with adoration, as they chose their people over others. In some cases that was indeed the case, but the majority of their civilians refused it. They wanted to be one. They demanded that those leaders return and join the growing community and when they denied the request, they were removed from power. Some were replaced peacefully, but in other places with more totalitarian regimes, more blood was spilled. It was not only leaders affected by popular opinion. Companies and individuals who attempted to capitalize on limited goods were shut down. Companies were dissolved with assets seized. Individuals were arrested with their personal belongings taken and used to help. Greed was not allowed to persist. Cities were slowly cleared, the immensity of the task slowing the task. No matter how many people went to help, how many resources were provided, there was always more to do. But we carried on, refusing to give up. As the world came together and cities were cleared, a pair of websites were created. On the first, images of the dead were uploaded as respectfully as possible. It was created in an effort of providing some closure to families who lost loved ones. The second was a digital memorial. Whoever wanted could submit pictures, stories, videos, anything they wanted to remember those who were lost. A growing opinion was prevalent throughout. We would have vengeance for all that we lost. Whoever these aliens were, they would be sure to pay. Weeks slowly crawled past as we began a new normal. Governments hashed out their policies, bring them in line with another. In many quarters there was resistance to change. Joining together was a noble sentiment, but the nitty-gritty caused more than a few issues. But the weight of public opinion pushed them on. With mounting pressure, details were hammered out. It was an extraordinary process. What would normally have taken years to iron out, now took days. 
As each part was finalized, the patchwork of governance was sewn together. Information flowed freely. Military knowledge was aligned with experimental weapons and armor spread to be tested across the world. A new industrial revolution came about, as places with outdated infrastructure found themselves upgraded to the modern era. Having lost much of the production industry, it was agreed to spread the burden out. More places meant they were less likely to be targeted individually, making a series of redundancies in case they returned to do the same thing again. As the months trickled by, a few cities were nearing completion of the clearance. Debates raged around how the sites should be treated. Some wanted them rebuilt as they were. Others thought they should be left as sites of historical importance. Yet others said they should be redesigned and rebuilt, with focus on defense and ease of escape. As the debates continued, behind the scenes the greatest minds on space came together. With the sharing of knowledge and materials, they leaped ahead in development. As they prepared for the next stages in exploration, the International Space Station reported an anomaly. They had spotted what looked to be a crate in a perfect orbit over Earth. It had markings that failed to match any records. When a telescope was focused upon it, they found it to be made of a familiar black metal, the same as the alien ships. There was an immediate discussion on what to do with it. Two points of view emerged with near equal backing. The first was a preemptive strike. Blow it out of the sky, reduce it to dust. They feared it was another weapon that would fire whenever. Or worse, it kept the aliens in the loop about what we were doing. The other camp was to take it, bring it down and study it. We could use it and possibly advance our technological level by thousands of years. Destroying it would be a tremendous waste. They also reasoned that if they were using it monitor us, destroying it would likely end badly again, whereas studying it could put us in their good books and make them leave us alone for now. They weren't simple decisions, but ones that had to be made. Arguments raged left and right, with opinions shifting daily. But as at last conclusions were made, with the cities it was agreed to rebuild them with adapted infrastructure. It would take decades to complete, but it had to be done. With the crate, it was settled on that it would be collected. The benefits far outweighed the risks. And it was reasoned that if they wanted us all dead, they would have done so anyway. Plus, if they did, we couldn't do much to stop it. An old shuttle was brought out of retirement for collection. Space engineers worked to get it operational, with a way of collecting this crate. Without knowledge of its mass, they opted for a drag-and-drop style collection. It would bring it into a crash course to land in the ocean where it could be retrieved for study. As plans were made and the World Union was finalized, there was a global government in place which oversaw everything. But below it, countries had their own governments who could tackle smaller issues with greater accuracy, much like councils. Together, they made the Gaian Union.